you see this expression? Do you see this expression? This is the expression I used to get. My grandmother used to take us down to Mackie Ben's Toy Store in Abilene, Texas, give us a $5 bill, and say, go get you something to play with. Why am I making this expression today? I'm going to get stuff to play with. The owner of the place I, I'm renting told me that this piece of property right next to him, he is going to be bulldozing next week. So if there's anything on here I wanted, I could have it. Uh, so I went immediately went and borrowed my dad's chainsaw, and today we're going to wander around. I'm going to try and find some fairly straight trees going straight up and down so there's a very little reaction wood in there, uh, and see if I can find any knots, I mean any burls, which in an initial viewing, I don't know if this right here is a burl or not, but since it's only going to be burned anyways, might as well take it down and see. This is all oak that he's got left over. He's already come through here and gotten all the cedar uh, for fence posts. I'm not sure what kind of oak it is. Uh, live oak is really common around here, but live oak has its uh, leaves on all through winter, and this is the beginning of February, uh, so I'm not sure what this is. It might be post oak. And, you know, me being a wood turner uh, about half the time, uh, I have this thing, I do not like to buy wood, so free wood's the best wood, the greener the better. So being able to get it straight from the tree is really, really nice. Now I will say this, I don't fell trees very often. I've probably done one or two in my life. I've been with other people that have done it. Uh, most of my trees come from stuff that's already on the ground. Past customers call me and tell me when stuff that's fallen over in their backyard or, their, or a relative's backyard or I contact an architect who's uh, deconstructing a place and after they bulldoze them over, uh, that's when I get them. But this one, I'm going to come out here and I'm going to cherry pick one. Now, I only have a week to get what I can, so I'm going to cherry pick as best as possible. So that tree right there is about the size tree I want, but I notice it is leaning quite a bit. So there's probably a lot of reaction wood in it. It'd be very hard to straighten out, but for wood turning, it might be okay. Uh, it's also going to be a little bit more difficult, so any tree that's leaning, I'm going to make sure that whenever I fell it, nothing's in its path in the direction it's leaning, because I don't want it to deal with ropes and stuff like that. So if I don't find anything else, something like that might be pretty damn good. Now about a third of the trees, they look like they've been dead for a while, so if it doesn't have a little sapling springing up or anything like that, I'm going to leave it alone. I don't want to deal with any widow makers or anything like that. Uh, that's something I'll leave for the machinery. Now my sister's lathe that I'm using, the Jet, uh, its maximum throw is 16 inches. So basically I'm just looking for a tree that I can barely reach around, maybe not even touch my hands when I reach around. And that'll be about the size I want. Uh, anything bigger and then it's kind of wasted on my lathe and it's just more to hassle to uh, cut up and drag out. Plus, the saw I borrowed from my dad is only, a 18, has, only has an 18-inch bar, so I'm kind of limited there, but that should be about, about right. 18 to 20 inches, and I should be okay. Now, this one has some promise. It's straight up and down. Not really leaning. Has three branches coming out right there, so that there might be some interesting crotch wood right there. And I'm only going to be interested from about that crotch all the way down to about two feet above the ground. He did say that he wanted me to leave a two to three foot stump uh, so the bulldozer will be easier to push over. So that'll be, you know, quite a few good bowls right there. Maybe that'll be my first tree. Yeah, I think this will be the tree I start out with. It's about as big as my lathe can handle. I borrowed my sister's lathe and it has a 16 inch throw. I, can, I can't touch my hands around that, so that tells me that's going to be that way, so that's, big enough for me to turn a bow, getting the pith out of the tree and trying not to get very much of the sapwood on bottom or top. And some live edge bowls would look pretty nice too. Uh, it has a nice wide path. I'm probably going to try and drop it this way simply because bulldozer and trucks can get around it over there. There's a little bit more open space there. And I can chop it up in the property line. Uh, it'll be well within the property line. This is a fairly straight up and down tree. So the first thing I'm going to do is cut a notch in it 
and from what I've understood if you have a fairly straight up and down tree you can get closer to the center of the tree when you're cutting out that triangle notch but you never really want to go past it uh, most people they say do 80% around or 30% through uh, if it's stable but uh, if you're having to wedge it or something like that on the other side to get it to tilt well there's less force you need to get it going over uh, I also uh, on the back cut will come up a, a little bit above that uh, the point of the wedge so that it will hinge back and it won't push back in and they tell you to do one inch above that one but I like to play it safe and go a little bit higher it means I have to come in a little bit more but there's pluses and minuses of everything so here are some of the tricks I've learned for, from using the chainsaw and understand I once again I don't fell trees very often maybe a couple in my lifetime most all the other hundred so hot trees I've done up have already been on the ground because that's people past customers call me or I talk to architects after they've taken trees down and that's how I get my wood most of the time when nature or build uh, or construction takes them down but if you are felling them, some nice things on, most chainsaw nowadays will put layout lines on their saws. You have these lines across here and these black lines across the top. And basically all you have to do is line those up and that will give you a perfect 90 degrees so that you can see where you're going to be felling it. Also the fact, if you need to go 45 degrees, if you just hold it on the hook, that generally gives you 45 degrees so that you can come down at the right angle and you come across until you line up those black lines and you'll get it all from there. It's fairly easy. They actually designed these things to make felling and cutting trees easier. Who knew? Just because I'm a nervous Nelly about felling the tree part of it, uh, I'm, everyone says you have to get just dead on perfect the angle you cut. Now most people will cut a flat angle like that on the bottom, the hinge, uh, excuse me, the notch, and then come up at 45 degrees up to 75 degrees to pimp on the, how the tree is leaning. Uh, I like to go down a little bit less than 90 degrees just for safety sakes. But how do you get it to line up from this side to this side to make sure it's flat and even? Well, I use these. Uh, I haven't seen anybody else do that. but. What's nice about it is it points the direction you're going to be going. You just kind of get it flat, then drop it down to the angle you want. Run your hand with a piece of chalk, and there's your angle. And it'll be nice and consistent, going in the direction you want. Then you can do the same thing coming from up top. Just visualize your angle. And you'll have a nice chalk line on the tree to at least get close to it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it gives you a good start for us nervous Nellies. Now I want you to notice something. I missed my mark. If you see, you can see the saw curve in the, down in the bottom. That's actually kind of dangerous. So I need to come back in. I need to recut this top one section, but I'll just come in at a steeper angle. That won't make much of a difference. I want to make sure I hit this bottom line dead on perfect so there's no extra saw curve. Because if there's an extra saw curve, whenever it falls over, if it's two angles meeting, it'll just collapse like that. But if there's like a hinge right there, it'll hit and before it's already fallen over, that soft curse closed up and it could pressure the thing coming back. So I need to recut this so I get that dead on perfect with that line there. Also, it's a little bit off this way, that way, but that's not that big a deal. We're wide open area. So you 
want to notice I did not come past halfway of the tree. I left a good section right there. The next step I'm going to cut is the hinge, and this is the most critical part. Uh, you do not want to cut the hinge even. You want to cut it, uh, everyone tells you to do it one inch above the base. I'm probably going to go a little bit higher right there, and I'm going to start it with my saw. I'm going to get a little ways in, then I'm going to put a wedge in the back so that the tree won't collapse on my saw, and then I'm going to keep going until somebody in the background tells me this tree starts to move. At that point, I'm going to go straight at 45 degrees, not forwards, no backwards, and run away with the saw and just let the tree fall. There it goes. Well, if you notice, it wasn't a clean cut, but it fell whenever I heard it started cracking. I backed off, so it fell when I was going away. You can see that my uh, hinge cut wasn't all the way there. I missed it the first time, so I stuck a wedge in it so it wouldn't move, and I recut it before it got too far forward. But the tree's down, and we're alive. Dad's here with me, and he's getting into this three dark deep sculptural carving, which is really weird. It's actually sculpting things like dragons and cats and stuff on just the lathe. So he's looking for uh, crotch wood that's going to re react and bend to form, do the forms that he wants. So that's what he's doing right now, is picking up from the branches the stuff he really does want. Now I'm going to be taking from about right there to right about there and get, not using that one section right there and those are going to be bowl slabs and I should be able to get three bowls out of each round. So we've got it marked out so it's roughly a square of the trunk which is bigger than what I can put on my lathe but it'll give us a little extra in case there's any crackage and we've got the weight removed from the crown of the tree off and we've got a log down here holding the weight over there so that we can saw through without worrying too much about getting our chainsaw into the dirt. got them all cut up in little squares cut a v-notch in the stump so I can put them on the side and I cut them in, I can cut them in half getting rid of the pith going with the grain instead of going straight into end grain which is dulls your saw blade really really quickly so let's make some bow blanks cut the blank we can see we've got a crack running right down the middle right through that pit so we're lining it to where we can cut straight down and not have any cracks in this area so right there's the pit so we'll come down something like that cut that out and get rid of the pit and we'll come over here and get a flat on this side and a flat on this side and there's our bowl blank right there Nice bowl blanks.
and there we go we're looking about 16 inches that way so we should be able to get a very nice bowl that would just about take up the whole log so we got about 16 more to go well here's what I kept out of that tree I got very eight very large bowl blanks and sometimes when I cut the pith out of it, I will keep these quarter sawn sections so I can either uh, do some rails for a chair, a green chair, or I'll dry it for bowl uh, box making. Uh, normally what I would do is one of every four of these, uh, I will turn green completely and I will finish it and I'll just let it warp out for a week or two and then I'll put it on the market to sell. The rest of them I will rough turn fairly thick let them fully dry and then turn them this way at least one out of four of them i can get on the market and get a little cash coming in but for this video just so y'all can see here's that one that first one i did in the video we marked the circle out i am going to put it on the band saw to cut out the circle out so i can get the maximum size for the lathe that i will work with which is 16 inches or as close as i can there and then we'll go all the way to the finish on this one now the tree fell at noon, it is 5 o'clock today, so maybe from, from tree to the finished product we'll be done before evening. Let's get busy. Now when I say the maximum size my lathe can handle is 16 inches, what I'm talking about is from the center of my drive spur to the bed of this particular lathe is right at 8 inches. So anything more than 16 inches it will be hitting the bed and it will stop and won't rotate. So that's why a lot of my the largest bowls I make are generally about 14 inches because I'll put 15 and a half, 15 inches, and I turn it down just a little bit just to make it look right. So let's get this uh, cut out so that we can at least get it on the lathe. Now when you are laying out your wood to cut with, this is where you start doing a little bit analysis. Uh, you're looking at for any knots. This right here is obviously going to be cut out at that spot, but if I were to move the circle over, that might be in the rim of the bowl. I have a little bit of wormwood. That's a cool medulla raise right here. I like that one. But here's the things I'm looking at. Right here is where the sapwood ends on both sides. So if I draw you where the sapwood ends, I want to kind of balance the whole look. Now whenever I do this, I just so, so happen to have a trash can lid that is exactly 15 and a half inches 15 and a quarter inches so a lot of times this is what i use to get my maximum i can i will kind of fit it i've got a little flare right there but i don't have a flare on this side so i'm going to try to come over a little bit more than i normally would and balance it out when i draw my circle and there we go i will draw a 15 inch circle which will take me from bark to bark I'm going to come all the way over to this edge right here. Now the reason why I typically cut a little bit extra wide, because when cracks happen, they, they'll start cracking today probably, I can generally cut out the cracks as I get started in. That whole batch of bowls that I just showed you a second ago, I've got to get those turned in the next day or two to at least rough standards so that they will be useful. Okay, so now I have a nice round circle. So here's where the part where you get to do a little bit of your craftsmanship to make the bowl turn out fairly nice. So right here we have the transition between heartwood and sapwood. And the idea behind this is I want it to look somewhat balanced. The center of the tree was right there. So looking at this design right here i need to figure out where i'm going to put the center points because i'm actually going to start turning this between centers for the exact reason that i can move it around i can shift it to get the best look now the way this tree was it was fairly straight so i have a very fairly even uh curve if the tree was leaning a lot of times the pits would the center tree would be offset so you'd have something a little bit offset so you would have to cut it from the tree a little bit differently 
to get somewhat of a balance. I got lucky with this tree. That's why I picked this tree. So the center will come right about, I'm going to say right like that right there to hit my center. Maybe right like that. So lining this up, I'm going to put my, I'm going to start out making my center of the turning right about there. And I just kind of eyeball the center right there. And then on the other side, I will do the same thing. You kind of eyeball it, finger-wise, okay, that looks about right there. So that's where I'm going to start out with. But once I've got it spinning, if I think it'll look a little bit better, there's no reason why I can't undo my tailstock and move my center points on either the drive side or the thing, or the live side, to get the best looking bolt. So one of the cool things about these one-way drive chucks that you can squeeze into your thing is that the center point is not only replaceable if you damage it, but it's extendable. So I keep it kind of tight when I'm turning very dry woods like my boxes, but whenever I want to turn something wet, I can undo with a little Allen key and it extend it out a little bit. It's a little bit spring-loaded to make it a little bit deeper and then re-tighten it back up, just to make it a little bit nicer. When turning green wood, especially a big heavy one, and you're starting out between centers, you really have to pound it in deep because it will tend to rotate and spin in the green wood if it doesn't have a good bite. And in barely, because like most men, I think bigger is better. I try to get the maximum size possible, and when you get it on the lathe, of course, it's going to jam every now and then. So time to get out the deconstruction saw and knock off the corners. Okay, we got spinning, not hitting, clearing. So the next part is the most boring and somewhat violent part. You'll notice I put up on a carpal tunnel brace because this is just pounding work. There's no way around it that I know of. We're just going to spin it slow and put it into round and try and get it balanced. And while I'm doing it, you might see me loosen and reattach it to get it situated so that the grain is going to come out somewhat centered in the bottom of the bowl. I will fiddle with it at this point and then I'll put a tenon on it, put it in a chuck, and we'll start hollowing. Grab the face shield at this point in time. Okay, I'm kind of liking the balance here between the sapwood and the heartwood. I believe I got it right on where I want to be, or at least close enough to move on. Check out the medulla rays. I love coming across that grain. Too bad we can't keep them. You're going to be sharpening off at this stage because going through that bark just really does dull, dull your tools. But sharpen often because it doesn't take that long. I mean, it's literally drop it in the jig, set your depth. Turn on your grinder, go from one side to the other. And get back to work. Okay, we've got it mainly round, so now I'm going to flip it over so I can cut all this down and make a tenon. Okay, this is what I'm kind of looking for when I look for balance. You see the bark, that's going to be cut off, but see, it shows you the diameter. They're exactly opposite each other, and you're starting to see the heartwood come through on both sides. This one is a little bit lower than this one. So there's a, I might want to just reposition it a tad bit 
higher like this and then return it and that will lower this side down a little bit and bring this side closer to that side and that way it'll start getting a little bit more balanced I'm gonna do it a little bit more but that's giving you the idea I'm looking at it, and that's what I can do when I've got it in between centers before I add that tenon now just to show you how far out of round I'm purposely doing it just to line up the grain remember this was completely flat when I took it and flipped it look at how out of round it is now again I would rather waste a little bit extra wood and get a better looking bowl that's going to command a lot more money than have something that looks a little bit half-assed. I mean, the wood was free, so why don't we not get the best bowl you possibly out of it, can out of it? As you can see it's somewhat balanced now everything's somewhat centered which is what I was going for I left a little bit of a rim on the top and this is the rough shape I like and I've got a tin on it so now I'm going to take it off flip it around and start the hollowing process uh, and then we'll go from there if you see it you can see the colors changing as we talk because this thing is so wet so it should go pretty quickly So here we go. It's nice and balanced and round so I can pick up the speed. My next step is I am going to finish the shaping the outside and I will do something with this lip right here. Because I'm going from the tree to a finished bowl minus a little hand sanding in a few weeks and adding the oil and wax to it at that time. Uh, this is going to be done. Uh, I cannot have any decorations where it will be thicker in one spot and thinner in another. Because the thicker part will have more tension than the thinner part and it won't allow it to move evenly and that's how you develop cracks. Green turning is generally somewhat boring stylistically. The challenge is to get it very even and thin all the way down so it will warp correctly. Now you're not going to see me sand this at all simply because it's so wet it would just gum up any kind of sandpaper. What I'm going to do is once I'm finished with it, I'm going to put it in its own shavings in a paper bag and I'll let that sit for a few days. I'll swap out the shavings at that time and let that sit for probably a week. Then I'll pull it out of the shavings and let it sit on the shelf for about a week. So in about two to three weeks, uh, I will hand sand this, apply my oil, apply my wax and put it up for sale. And I would tell people that it is very green. You can feel the temperature change. It will continue to warp and move on you, but that's kind of what's cool about it. Also, when I'm hollowing, you're going to see me finish and uh, thickness it as I go along because the farther down into the bowl, the outside is drying on the lathe and it's warping on the lathe. I don't want to have to go back and constantly re true it. It is not going to be round when I'm done by the time I reach the bottom of this bowl. But once again, that's the style of green turning. So let's get to hollowing and finishing this thing out. And I don't care if it's flat work or round work, Never trust your eyes. If you need to see if something's smooth, feel it. I got a little, it's a little bit high right there. I can feel that. I can't really see it. It looks good to me, but I can feel I need to take off right there a tad bit more.
Well, the exterior shape's done and the interior's done, and I did hit it with 150 grit sandpaper just because I did. It gummed up pretty quickly, but uh, it's all there. Uh, I think I probably got a little bit thin right in this spot, but it looks okay. So I'm going to take you off the chuck, replace the jaws, swip it around, do the base, and we'll be done. And there you go. From a tree to a bowl in a day. Now, I cut down that tree a little after noon. I want to say about 1 o'clock. And it is about 9.30 now. So that's how long it took. But I want you to see. I don't know if you can see it. This wood is already crackling readily. Generally, you want to put some uh, oil or wax. or I mean, some oil paint or wax on it to prevent the cracking. But it's going to happen. That's why you need to rough these out as fast as you possibly can. Uh, I'm probably going to get these done tomorrow just to a rough state, not a finished state, and then in storage to dry out. But you wait too long, it's going to be wasted. One thing I do want you to notice, how many tools did I use? I made it a point, this was the only tool. From start to finish, from log to bowl, I only used one tool. So you don't have to have a huge amount of tools to do this kind of stuff. Just a few few techniques, nothing overly dramatic. Anybody can do this. Uh, just put your mind to it, read up, and take your time. And of course, remember the last thing you want to do is clean up. Because these wet shavings will rust everything they are sitting on. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider supporting us, visiting WorthTheEffort.com. We have an entire support page with a lot of different ways you can support us, not just monetarily. And please like, favorite, subscribe, tell your friends, help us boost the channel. And I want you to remember one last thing. It is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. I got to clean up. <laughs> Y'all be safe and have fun.